There you go. Well, here's a story for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for Dan and any of our chicken farmers in the church today, if anybody else is here that's raising chickens. Um, competitive chickens spend time fighting, not producing. This is a great story. An evolutionary biologist at Purdue University named William Muir studied chickens. He was interested in productivity. I think it's something that concerns all of us, but it's easy to measure in chickens because you just... Count the eggs. He wanted to know what could make <clears throat> his chickens more productive. So he devised a beautiful experiment. Chickens live in groups. So first of all, he selected just an average flock. And he let it alone for six generations. But then he created a second group of individually most productive chickens. You could call them super chickens. And he put them together in a super flock. And each generation, he selected only the most productive for breeding. After six generations had passed, what did he find? Well, the first group, the average group, was doing just fine. They were all plump and fully feathered, and egg production had increased dramatically. What about the second group, the super chickens? Well, all but three were dead. They'd pecked the rest to death. <laughs> Pretty fascinating, indeed. Well, we're thinking about here the importance of unity. We talked about unity last week, and we're going to talk about it again this morning and specifically moving from me to we. Last week we looked at some of the theology behind our unity. Uh, but I want to talk this morning about the importance of moving from me to we, this concept, uh, and what it looks like in the church. Um, the Bible is pretty clear that a divided house cannot stand. And our unity is vital to our success, to our testimony, and even ultimately to, to our peace, the peace that we experience as we live our life out. And so <clears throat> we want to think about this connection a little bit there between unity and peace in any relationship in the church and even in your home. If you don't have unity, you won't have peace. Now here's the thing. We're talking about a unity here. It is a unity that the world longs for. The world wants this unity. They, they want to be able to get along and they want to be one. It, yet it evades them, and it is the unity that the church actually has a unique hold on. And we saw last week that you cannot have unity outside of the church. You really can't have true unity because unity is rooted in the gospel. It is Jesus Christ who ultimately allows us to understand and experience true unity. Now, thinking about this reality, uh, thinking about this longing for unity and how we need to experience and display it, what is the biggest obstacle to unity? Think about, what's the biggest obstacle to unity? Well, I'm going to tell you the biggest obstacle to unity is you and me. It, it's ourselves. We are the biggest obstacle to unity in the end. It's ourselves. It is our selfishness. It really is. And what is selfishness? But it's thinking of yourself more than others. And when I think of myself more than others... Um, that's selfishness, and that's the biggest obstacle, really, to experiencing unity. And just think about the contrast evident in just that definition there when you think about that, because we're talking about a contrast here between living in the spirit and living in the flesh. Selfishness is rooted. It's one of my common flesh patterns. It's, it's all about me, and the spirit is not all about me. The spirit is all about Christ, and it's all about you. It really is. It's a totally different trajectory of life when we live in the Spirit. Look at James 3.16 here. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And so selfish ambition, it leads to disorder and disunity and disharmony and all kinds of stuff. And every vile practice proceeds out of that because it is a flesh pattern. It is certainly not a byproduct of the Holy Spirit spirit selfishness does not allow me to move from me to we as it is only concerned with myself now think about your own home a moment think think in your own in the own home you live in if if everybody in your home is only concerned about themselves and what's best for them and there's no concern about 
each other in the greater good. What kind of home are you going to have? A lot of disunity, a lot of disorder, a lot of disharmony, a lot of fighting and arguing, and you certainly will not know peace. You will know disappointment and discord and disorder. So this morning, I want to help us move from me to we. Really, primarily, we're talking about it as a church, but you can take this message home today and apply it in your home very, very, very easily. Here's today's big idea. I, myself, can add to or subtract from the unity of my church. I can bring greater harmony to the church or sow discord in the church. We all have that choice. Every one of us can do that. And the reality is, is, as I said, you can take that and replace church with home and take this message home today and apply it in your home in the same way. That your home can be a place of great unity and harmony and oneness. But it really comes down to it starts with us. Okay, let's look at our key text today, Philippians 2. I'm going to read down through verse 11 here, and we're just going to kind of, kind of take three things out of here that can help us all move from me to we. Philippians 2, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, uh, <clears throat> any sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And three things in here, three ways that I can move from me <clears throat> to we, three very simple things. And let, let's look at the first one here. It's simply this, as we aim for a common goal. As we aim for a common goal, we move from me <clears throat> to we. It's not all about what I want, but it's the common goal we pursue as a church. Philippians 2, two, the verse 2, it says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And so there's this real this idea of sameness and thinking and being together in the way we think as we aim for a common aim for a common goal. We need this shared objective as a church, working toward the same thing. There's that old illustration. I think I've used it before. <clears throat> Maybe you saw it. The guy goes out and shoots a bunch of arrows, you know, in the air, and then he goes out and draws targets around him. <laughs> Makes you feel real good, right? But it's not very successful. If you aim at nothing, you're going to hit nothing. So you can go out there and draw the targets you want around your arrows. But we need to draw the target first, and we need to aim at that target. That's what we need to do. And so uh, that's what we need to strive for as a church. We have a vision statement here that, w- that kind of gives us some direction that we put together years ago with the board that kind of gives us some direction where we're going. We have our mission statement here. Um, Again, we've mentioned this a few weeks ago, to glorify God through authentic relationships that embrace and share the Christ life. That's kind of, that's what we're shooting at. That's what we're aiming at. There's kind of a target there. Um, Let me give you three examples of a target that we can all kind of connect on, I think. We need to aim for the heart of the gospel. One of the things. We need to aim for the very heart of the gospel and everything we do as a church. And uh, that's very, very, very important. This is really what we talked about last week. These are the seven ones in Ephesians that unite us all as, as believers in Christ. There are seven things that unite us. It's aiming for the heart of the gospel. Unity is rooted in the gospel. Now, listen, we can be united as a church in here around the gospel, but here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. The gospel transcends churches and transcends our denominational and our uh, um, doctrinal differences of churches, and it it allows churches to really be united, to to gather around the the cross and and the the power and simplicity of the gospel. 
there is ultimately only one true gospel. And ultimately, we are not in competition with the churches around us that preach the one true gospel. We're not in competition with them. We are here to do the work that God has called us to do and to reach the people that God sends to us. Galatians chapter 1, here's what Paul said, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. There's the one gospel, the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of grace. It's the gospel that's founded upon the cross. But even if we are an angel from heaven, Paul says, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Are we in competition with anybody? Well, if someone's out there and they're not preaching the gospel of the cross and the resurrection, well, then, yeah, then I'd say maybe we are have a little competition, but that's not where most churches are today. And so we're not in competition with other churches. We are here to really stand. And the reason the gospel can unify us across different churches is because there is simply one true gospel. There's not a social gospel. There's not a prosperity gospel. There's not a feel-good gospel. There's not a work-harder gospel. There's not a try-harder gospel. There is the one gospel that is rooted in the cross, the gospel of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to aim for that in everything we do. We need to aim for the heart of the gospel. And we also need to aim for the heart of the lost. At the same time, what a way to unify our church, but to say we're going to aim for the heart of the lost. One of the things in our vision statement, it, it, we have this phrase in there, that lost people matter most. And what does that mean, lost people matter most? It simply uh, kind of reflects what Jesus said in the Gospels when he said he would leave the 99 and go after that one lost sheep. That one lost sheep mattered the most because they didn't have a relationship with him. And so <clears throat> we kind of want to understand that as a church. How do, we, how do we do that? How do lost people matter most? Part of it is when we are dealing with people who are unsaved, who people who are on a spiritual journey. It's just finding a way to make them comfortable. If they come to church, that we want to make them somewhat comfortable so we can share the gospel with them. If people are asking questions and looking for answers, how can we provide those answers and yet make them comfortable? Now, here's the thing. If we're aiming for the heart of the gospel, that means you can't. You can't water down the gospel. You can't compromise the gospel. You can't change the gospel. Because we're aiming for the heart of the gospel. And that's what they need. They need the heart of the gospel. But still there has got to be a way to aim for the heart of the gospel and for the heart of that lost person as well. We cannot take the offense out of the gospel. The gospel will always be offensive. In Jesus' day, he offended a lot of people. Now, here's what's fascinating. I always find this fascinating. In Jesus' day, he offended a lot of the religious people, because the gospel's offensive. And the religious people, number one, well, they didn't think they were that bad. And number two, they didn't think they needed anybody to save them. They could save themselves. And the gospel tells us, <laughs> you're rotten to the core, you're a sinner, and you can't save yourself. So the gospel is offensive. And, and the religious people found it offensive. In Jesus' day, the ones who didn't find it offensive were the people who were marginalized by society, who were defined by and known for their sin, who were looked down upon, the woman at the well, the woman who came in, the prostitute came in and worshipped at Jesus' feet, the tax collectors, the publicans, the sinners, the, the alcoholics, all those people in Jesus' day, they were the ones that were somewhat comfortable around Jesus. And, and I think they were comfortable with his message of grace and his acceptance and his forgiveness. At the same time, I think they were comfortable with the truth that he told. Because they realize they can look at their own life and say the lies we've bought into and the lifestyle of sin we've embraced has left us empty. And so Christ came along and he gave them the truth. He didn't compromise the truth. He was the truth. And so they were very comfortable around him while the religious folks weren't. There's this thing where we need to be able to aim for the heart of lost people. Now you might say, you might say, well, Hey, on a Sunday morning, if someone comes to visit, how do we know if they're lost? Well, we don't. So what does that mean? It means anybody that walks through the door matters most, matters more than me. Anybody that's a guest or a visitor, we want to make them feel like they matter most. Not more, of course, than God. Because ultimately, we need to aim for the heart of God. 
We want to unify ourselves. Let's aim for the heart of God. And you know, one of the things that's really near and dear to the heart of God is when brothers live together in unity. Psalms 133.1. When we can move from me to we as a church, that is something that is really near and dear to the heart of God. He has put us together into the one church, into the one body. He has done that. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies, and one who soars discord among the brothers. So God is a God who desires that we live in unity. We need to aim for the heart of God. So the first thing we want to do, we want to aim for a common goal. That will help us move from me to we. Here's the second thing we can do. It is simply this, as we celebrate a mutual salvation. As we celebrate a mutual salvation. Therefore God, it says in Philippians 2, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. What's this verse saying to us here? Well, look at that word therefore. Always ask yourself, why is that therefore? What is it therefore? Well, this is totally a response. We are worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ in response to the fact that he went to the cross, that he carried out the gospel. And we're responding to that. And one of the ways we unify ourselves as a church is we simply celebrate the mutual salvation that we experience in Christ. As we celebrate this mutual, so we are all saved by the same gospel in the same way. You know, it's interesting, you think about our unity and how it can be kind of seen in our worship. Think about the, the words um, harmony and discord and how those are musical terms. And there is a sense when we worship, we can get a picture of our unity because we have sopranos and altos and tenors and basses and we have those that have different experiences and those that offer different expressions. Those that have different musical abilities and yet together we all come together and the finished product sounds beautiful and is beautiful to God. God did not make us all the same. And there's something beautiful about that within the context of worship. We're not all the same, but when we come together and bring what we have, I think the expression is beautiful to the Lord. It simply is. Psalms 111.1, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Together we can come and we can worship God. And it, it is more powerful than we realize. It really is. It's powerful in my own spiritual walk. It's powerful for the lost people that come in and watch us worshiping the Lord. I've said this before because worship is so unique. The kind of worship we do, the singing to our Savior is so unique to the Christian faith. I don't think a lot of religions have hymn books or, or worship carols or, or praise, worship praise songs they sing. I, I just don't think that's been the case. But that's unique to the Christian faith. And part of the reason for that is because we are more than a religion. We're, we're about a relationship and so we are singing to our Creator and to our Savior. And that's why worship is so personal and so powerful and so real within the body of Christ. Thinking about this worship, you know, we need worship that is gospel-centric. It's one way I, I think we can clearly define our worship. We need worship that brings out the unity that already exists in our congregation. Unity that celebrates the things we have in common, the mutual salvation, the victory we have in Christ, the common hope that we share. But what is, what is gospel-centric? Here's gospel-centric worship. Look at it this way. It exalts Christ and emphasis emphasizes my need for him. That's what gospel-centric worship is. It exalts Christ for what he has done and says, I desperately need you. And we need songs that can proclaim that very simple reality. We sing this song uh, sometimes, I need you. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, Lord, how I need you. I think about the Psalms where the congregation of Israel would, would sing about their mutual victories as Christ, as, as God delivered them from the red, through the Red Sea and into victory. And, and they would turn that into praise and worship as a congregation. We need, um, we need this gospel-centric worship. Look at this next passage. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. 
but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is a a sense here where our worship needs to be Spirit-breathed. Gospel-centric, but then Spirit-breathed. And what is Spirit-breathed worship? It's worship where the Holy Spirit just flows out of me. It's where the Holy Spirit in me worships with the Holy Spirit in you when we connect with one another. And I love this passage here back there in um, Ephesians because it's like there's these, these three different connections that are kind of going on. I am to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I am to be singing, making melody, and giving thanks. And I am at the same time addressing you and we are submitting to one another. And so together we're singing to one another. We're worshiping with one another and towards one another and we're building each other up as we worship addressing one another reminding each other of the victory we have in Christ we need worship that is spirit breathed where the Holy Spirit takes control of us and worships worships, uh, through us and then we need worship that is theologically sound worship that is theologically sound sound just simply put we need to sing songs that are accurate <clears throat> and so, somehow over the years god's given me a, a little bit of a sensitivity to this and when we when i look for songs for us to learn i try to find songs that i think are biblically sound and i you can be nitpicky and i'm not talking about being nitpicky you can be really nitpicky about every little i'm just talking there are some songs that express the gospel and convey christ very poorly and very inaccurately and teach truths that just aren't truth and um, I could give you some examples. I don't have time this morning. But there are just some songs out there that I scratch my head and think um, that doesn't really line up with Scripture. We need songs that are theologically sound. And I can find this in the newer songs of today. I, I brainstormed a bunch of words that I think can kind of define our theologically sound worship. Truthful, emotional, God's a God of emotion. We should have emotion when we worship. We should have joy and peace and love and personal, confessional, honoring, exalting, surrendering. All those words should, should kind of describe the worship that we offer up to the Lord. We need worship that is gospel-centric, that is spirit-breathed, and that is theologically sound. And when we worship in that sense, the reality is we can move from me to we. And we can find greater unity in the church. So it's aiming for the same goal. And um, then it's celebrating our mutual salvation. And then finally, number three, as we meet a shared need. We move from me to we as we meet a shared need. Think about that a moment. Think about this idea of shared needs. The fact that we are all a part of the same body and we all have some shared needs. There are needs that I have. And you know what? You have the identical need in your life. There are needs that we share. There are needs that we share because we're part of the same body. We share the same needs. And so the reality is there is something as we meet a shared need. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be graphs here's the reality there are needs you have in your life and as i as i seek to meet those needs and put you first and build you up you know what it works back to my benefit as i as i meet the needs in your life it comes back to benefit me because we're part of the same body we really are as we meet a shared need now how do i meet this shared need i meet your needs as i serve you and we saw in the passage earlier that christ was a servant Christ came down and served us and met our needs. And you know what? That was to his benefit because now we're a part of his family. He served and met the needs we have in our life and now we are a part of his family. And there's a thing where I can serve you and meet the needs that exist in your life and we can be a family and we can be one and we can move from me to we. Matthew, Jesus said it this way, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's a sense where we need to realize our responsibility to serve each other. 
and to try to meet the needs that exist in each other's lives. We need to see ourselves more, as we talked a couple weeks ago, that we are relationally designed, and I need to see myself more within the context of the body, of the church family. We, we really look at ourselves too much individually isolated out, and we need to see ourselves much, much more that we are a part of the church family and that I am responsible for you and you are responsible for me in some ways. Let me give you a handful of examples here of some of our shared needs. Think about this. Uh, considering each other's interests. You know what? I have a need for someone to take an interest in my life. I just, that's a need I have to be valued and honored in that way. You have that need as well. And so when we reach out and we put each other first, as Philippians said, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. As I look to you and I consider what's important to you and what's interesting to you. That's, that's good for me in the end. It builds up the body. 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. There's a thing about putting you first and considering your needs before my needs and if we would all do that, how amazing it would be. How about this, bearing each other's burdens Galatians 6.1 tells us, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God has designed us relationally. He has designed us so that I cannot do it on my own. That's, that's true of all of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, I cannot do it on my own. You can't. It's even hard to say it, isn't it? <laughs> I need you. That's the way God wired us. And he wired us in such a sense that we cannot bear the burden on our own. We need people to encourage us. We need people to lift us up, to support us, to pray for us. That's the way God designed us. And he tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. One of our shared needs is that we cannot do it on our own. And the reality is when we do this, we are just like Christ. When I bear your burdens, I am being just like Christ. How about honoring each other uh, more actually it should say honor each other daily but we need to honor each other more i love this verse in romans twelve ten. just imagine what your home would look like or your church would look like your relationships would look like if you live this verse out love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor what if we what if we got into a fight to see who could show each other more honor but i see i we have that shared need i have the need to be honored and valued and respected you have the need to be honored and valued and respected. It's simply, it's just, it's, that, it's just that simple. And the reality is, as we honor each other more, as we honor each other daily, we meet a shared need that exists in both of us and we move from me to we. How about this one? Forgiving each other freely. Does anybody in this room not need forgiveness? Of course, we have a shared need. We all need forgiveness. Now, I don't need to be forgiven by God. Here's the amazing thing. I don't need to be forgiven by God, right? But I do need to be forgiven at times by you and you by me and our relationships. I was thinking about forgiveness. You need to think of forgiveness as a bank account so that when Christ went to the cross and died there and forgave you of your sins, he gave you all the forgiveness you will ever need for every sin you will, uh, you've ever committed in your past, in your present, and in your future. And he dumped all this forgiveness into your, into your forgiveness account. And so anytime you sin and do something that's wrong, you have enough forgiveness to cover that sin. But you know what you also have? That when someone wrongs you, you have enough forgiveness in your account to take some forgiveness out and tell that person, I forgive you. Yeah, you hurt me. Yeah, you were wrong. Yeah, whatever. I forgive you. And I have enough forgiveness in my account because Christ has forgiven me. That's what the Bible tells us. We are to forgive as Christ forgave us. So we need to forgive each other freely. We have the shared need to be quick to forgive one another. That's simply that reality. And finally, one last shared need is affirming each other's identity. We all have the same need here to know who we are and to be reminded of who we are in Christ. And one of the things we need to do as a church is build each other up and to build each other up by, by reinforcing to each other who we are in Christ. 
that's a shared need we all have to know who we are in Christ and to have somebody continually remind us. And think about this again. Think about this. If I were to look at you more and you were to look at me more and we were to see Christ in each other, what, what if when I looked at you, I didn't just see you, but I saw Christ in you and I could affirm Christ in you. And if you saw Christ in me, uh, kids, think about this. If you looked at your mom and dad and you honored and obeyed your mom and dad, as the Bible says, because you knew that you were honoring and obeying Christ in them. Spouses, what if we loved and respected each other more and submitted to each other more because we looked at each other and we saw Christ in each other and knew that I was really ultimately loving and respecting and submitting to Christ because he's our identity. And we need to continually reaffirm to each other who they are in Christ and why they value and why they are so important to build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Acts 20.32, And now I commend you, wrote Paul, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. We need to build each other up and remind them of all that they have in Christ. Let me read you this story before we move into communion here fascinating story a 2016 episode on npr story corps interviewed frankios clemens who played the role of friendly officer clemens on mr rogers neighborhood for over 25 years clemens was the first black actor to have a recurring role on a children's television series surprisingly fred rogers was clearly going out on a limb to cast clemens as a police officer clemens knew this and expressed his reservations i grew up in the ghetto i did not have a positive opinion of police officers policemen were uh, sicking police dogs and water hoses on people and i really had a hard time putting myself in that role so i was not excited about being officer clemens at all still clemens eventually agreed to take on the role over the decades he spent on the show there was one scene in particular that clemens remembers with great emotion it was from an episode that aired in 1969 in which rogers had been resting his feet in a plastic pool on a hot day he invited me to come over and rest my feet in the water with him clemens recalls the icon fred fred rogers not only was showing my brown skin in the tub with his white skin as two friends but as i was getting out of the tub he was helping me dry my feet he says he'll never forget the day rogers wrapped up the program as he always did by hanging up his sweater and saying you make every day a special day just by being you and i like you just the way you are this time in particular rogers had been looking right at clemens and after they wrapped he walked over clemens asked him fred were you talking to me yes i have been talking to you for years rogers said as clemens recalls but you heard me today it was like uh, telling me It was like telling me I'm okay as a human being, Clemens said. That was one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had. The beauty here is that Mr. Rogers was an ordained minister and the unity he displays, the unity and the oneness that he exemplifies is simply an extension of his Christian faith. Mr. Rogers was putting the correct theology into practice, a theology that says all men are created equal and in the image of God. Can we do that for everybody? Can we affirm who we are in Christ? Today we're going to go to communion. I'm going to ask um, Harold and Ken to come down. Uh, Evan's going to come play some music for us and set the mood on the piano here. As we go to communion today, just think about this as we're going into communion. Think about, we think about those things that can unify us. And communion, the communion table is one of those things where we come together to again celebrate our mutual salvation, to recognize the cross and that Christ went there. And he went there for each one of us equally. He didn't go there for some more than others. We, we all come to this communion table just as guilty and just as forgiven as the other person in this room today. And if you know Christ, you're welcome to celebrate communion with us. And um, as they pass out the elements, take this time. There there is a verse here back in the communion story. It tells us, um, I believe it is verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. So this is a time in communion to stop and quietly examine our hearts and our relationship with God and um, let him reveal anything he wants to and there are some questions here on the screen that you can meditate on as well so Evan if you'd play for us if you'd pass out the bread we're going to go into